Thank you for joining us at this very special reading for Yellow Arrows Fall 2021 Journal, The Unfractious Issue, Volume 6, Issue 2. I'm Keshni Naika Washington. I'm a writer, a Durbanite, a Joe Burger, a Washingtonian, basically a scattling of South Africa, who is now an American writer living and working in DC. I've had the privilege of working with the amazing Yellow Arrow team to guest edit this issue on belongingness. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about their very vital work before we begin tonight's reading. Yellow Arrow Publishing supports and inspires writers identifying as women through publication and access to the literary arts. Women's voices have been historically underrepresented and we aim to elevate those voices by creating safe spaces through our programs, classes, workshops, writers groups, writers in residence, and publications, which includes several chapbooks every year, and our biannual literary journal of creative nonfiction, poetry, and cover art, for which we are doing the reading tonight. Note that this lit journal is also uniquely representing worldwide voices. Check out Yellow Arrow Bookstore on the website and subscribe to the newsletter to get the latest news and submission dates as well. Creating diversity in the literary world is deeply important work. It is our belief that when we share our stories with each other, it creates a ripple effect of empathy, compassion, and understanding. Creativity is an act of service. It's about contributing to the collective voice in our community. It's about saying, yes, we belong here too. Yellow Arrow's mission is to create these opportunities, more of them, for women to participate in the literary arts. We must share our voices so that our daughters, our nieces, our neighbors, all know that her individual lens is important. Expressing who we are and our experiences deepens our understanding and allows us to better empathize with one another. And this leads us to tonight's reading for the unfracturous issue. And fracturous refers to something that is full of windings and intricate turnings, things that twist and turn but do not break. And when applied to our overarching theme of belongingness, we receive so very many different, beautiful, and extremely personal submissions. Of all the stories we tell ourselves and others, the most significant follow the words, I am. We arrive at our identifications through many routes, either adopting what we are explicitly or implicitly told about who we are and where we fit, or deliberately breaking with it, and fashioning our own mosaic of belonging, unique to our choices and our intricate twistings and turnings of our personal experiences. To be a writer, poet or artist is to be an outsider. We give form to our experiences, creating channels and access points for others to connect to in the process and explore their own understanding of who they are. Once a thing is form, I believe we can choose to carry it or put it down or step beyond it. I believe belonging is not something we negotiate with the external world. It's inside of us. And now, let us hear from the cover artists, poets, and writers themselves who are featured in this and fractious issue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Durende. I'm an artist, I'm a writer, I'm a filmmaker. I've had a very circuitous life through creative endeavor. And for this issue, when I saw the theme of Enfractus, I had a Enfractuous, I had a light bulb moment because I've really just gone through a big change in my approach to my artwork. In the past, I've felt very ashamed of how messy my sketches were. I couldn't do these. I looked at people and watched videos and films of how quickly and easily people could sketch a shape. But for me, it was always messy. And I've been struggling against messiness all my life. In fact, I've, 
I've, um, I've worked a lot of geometry, geometric designs I was working on for a while, things with dots, things with rectangles, working with color and space and trying to put some movement in it. But then I kind of asked myself what would happen if I let all of that go and just painted, sort of embraced the messy. And two things happened. One, I remembered a story of myself at four years old. I'd gone to a friend's house and there was a big cardboard box. They'd just gotten a refrigerator or a washing machine and the box was gonna be the girls' playhouse. And we had crayons and we were gonna decorate it. And my dad had just told me a couple of days or maybe even the day before about how color wasn't the absence, the white light wasn't the absence of color, but the combination of all the colors. And so I had an idea and I started scribbling all the colors over the same area, trying to get it to have this image in my mind of the moment it would just break through and become blinding white. That didn't happen. It didn't happen because I didn't know the difference between pigment and light. And my friends, actually chased me away because I was ruining their beautiful idea of a princess palace or clubhouse by scribbling all over it. In any case, recently I've sort of embraced the scribble. If you look, it's up here is the painting. Maybe I will grab it and bring it down so that you can see just how scribbled it is. So close up, it's, I put pigment on it and messed with it and pigment on it and messed with it and had layer upon layer. And suddenly, when you go back from it, maybe on this side, it turned out to be a very satisfying abstract landscape. And so I've been exploring more and more, even if I'm doing something like, like flowers, if you look really close, you can see the scribbliness all through it. And I'm discovering how much the indirect, the circuitous, rather than the sort of blocky geometric, or even the realistic, sort of careful photographic representation, this is, pleases me, this speaks to my heart, this makes me happy to make, and I hope it makes it happy for you to see. So thanks to everyone at the magazine for choosing my picture for the cover. And I look forward to reading all the rest of your work, those of you who are in it, Good day, Vanakam, Sunny Bonani, Hoyadach. I am Keshni July, Ne Naidu, and I live in Edenvale, South Africa. The turning point for me towards acceptance and belonging was a person. A quiet, strong minded woman, similar to myself. She showed me what it meant to be unapologetically herself. She had strong values and strong opinions too. She stood by those opinions despite being introverted. Her inner strength was much deeper than mine and I wished I showed such courage. She gave me permission to be myself and inspired me to be the best most authentic version of myself. I am proud and excited to share my interpretation of the Anne Fractuous theme for the Yellow Arrow Journal with you, from which I'm going to be reading a couple of extracts now. What is in a name? It is a cultural and familial tradition to be given two names, a calling name and a registered name. The first letter of your registered name in Hindu custom is determined by the date and time of your birth and is read off astrological charts by a Hindu priest. Therefore, the Hindu name is chosen based on the alignment of the stars and planets at the time of your birth. A calling name, on the other hand, is a name by which you are known and called from birth. 
Keshni is the name I identified with for as long as I could remember. Sometimes I wondered if I was a lonely child because I chose to be alone, or if people treated me differently because of the name I bore. I frequently wondered what child I could have been if I had a name other than this new one. What experiences would I have had? I was raised in Pietermaritzburg, South Africa in the 1980s, when kids were seen and not heard. So I was a serious child, very quiet on the outside, and with a strong voice on the inside. The name calling did nothing to help the strong little girl to show herself, to be herself, and to own her space. There were moments of splendor when pushed too far. She lifted her chin, showed her strength and her passion, and left those around her shocked. There were moments of mischief too, a sense of humor showing its presence. Perhaps when inner strength is restrained, it fights doubly hard for its release. Throughout every experience, every year, and every phase of my life, I have reflected on belonging, or to be more accurate, the feeling of not belonging. Based on being different, being a girl, not having a pretty name, not having any friends, walking to school, not having a car, and not having enough money. Throughout adulthood, being outside the circle meant you were reserved, quiet, speak when you're spoken to, and answer when questioned. Not opinionated enough, not cultured enough, because you learned to eat with cutlery at age 21. Didn't belong to a clique of similar individuals, or didn't speak the same language as others. At every crossroad, I chose the path of not belonging to my surroundings simply because I didn't fit in. As a result, I was free to create my own path. A path of my making means that while I belonged to the world, more importantly, I belonged and belong to myself. The alternative was too expensive. The cost of belonging meant fitting in, following the socially accepted norms of a conservative culture, being narrowly defined and placed in the confines of an imaginary box. The lure of belonging is always great, but the taste and love of freedom is so much greater. I found out years later that my registered name, which has its origins in the Sanskrit word granum, means one who is beyond the influence of the planets. I remind myself of this because I still need to fully comprehend the deep meaning and significance of it. It is difficult to imagine, but when I reflect on my life and the hand of God over it, it makes sense. The academic, professional, and personal achievements I have worked hard for, the barriers I have broken, and the obstacles I have overcome can only be seen as defying the odds and creating one's own destiny. So if you asked me, what is in a name? I would be compelled to answer everything. Thank you. Hi there, 
My name is Vrashna Wadia, and I live in Santa Clara, California. I'd like to first thank uh, Yellow Arrow for this opportunity to share my poem about belonging with all of you. Um, my search for belonging has been a lifelong challenging journey, um, one that I can best describe as fleeting. Uh, one moment I might feel belonging and it feels great, and then the next moment I feel lost. I'd say maybe the turning point for me was when I traveled to Prince Edward Island many years ago, and I felt deeply connected to the land and the people there. I hadn't felt like that before anywhere else I had visited or lived, um, and it was an amazing feeling. So since that time, uh, what I've taken away from that in terms of belonging is, um, these days at least, I, I find belonging when I go into nature. So that could be going for a walk in, in the forest or going to the ocean or going to an urban park and watching the birds and um, just being in nature really gives me a sense of belonging and I don't feel like she ever lets me down. So, um, okay, so having said that, I will now read my poem entitled Open Spaces. When we stand under the giant redwood bough as she welcomes us home, is our desire to gentrify dirt from trail, pave a path through the undergrowth, extricate life from fallen trunks and decay that are still living? Is our need to pluck maiden hairs because they protect mushrooms we can't see, yet deem dangerous? When we plod sodden earth on days that hang weary and wonder where we belong when squeezed out of breath, out of home, out of space, we remember the forest, how she offers no space for otherness to own us. Every breath moves in her wildness, like wind, like stream, like you and we belong. So why not just open? Thank you very much. Greetings. Thank you, Yellow Arrow Publishing, for selecting my story. My name is Marla Naidu. I was born in South Africa and live in Sydney, Australia. I'm a tutor, teacher, author, and university advisor. The turning point for me was when I realized that racism was alive, no matter where I lived but it was up to me to tell my story, to allow myself and others to belong. I will now read an excerpt from my story, Fear and Hope. Anything that threatens a sense of belonging entrenches fear and a deep-seated need to be accepted. Being born on the wrong side of the Kalabai in Natal under South Africa's apartheid regime left the child in me fearful of the law for most of my life. I did not want to be seen or heard during those fearful years. In an innate quest to belong, I turned to reading Jane Austen and Charles Dickens and plays that depicted all things other than my skin tone, culture, and what little life experience I had gained in junior high school. Colonialism left its mark in making me want to belong. As a child, one of the ways I imagined doing this was to experience Christmas as Britain and other parts of the European world did. Lo and behold, the Christmas tree in my parents' one-bedroom apartment, decked with cotton wool, became the snow-filled Christmas landscape I desired, not what I knew. Adorned window panes dotted with cotton wool and my head of bountiful hair stuffed under a velvet Christmas hat made all my South African Christmases a sweltering experience. This was the beginning of wanting to belong, according to my understanding gained from Eurocentric literature I had read. I mimicked my way into a pseudo sense of belonging, extending to my desire to produce a theatrical performance in my parents' tiny dining room, which was at the entrance of their tiny one-bedroom flat. While parents were away at work, apartment 18 turned into a theatre 
with furniture pushed aside to clear the way for a stage. Weeks prior to the performance, I visited the local Market Square library in the small town of Peter Maritzburg on a hunt for a play script. The one I chose, adult me shudders to reveal, was Toad of Toad Hall. Later in life, I cringe at the thought of not having written my own African script for a palpable, authentic sense of belonging to the land and culture of my birth. My high school years ignited the questions of injustice in relation to the divisiveness of apartheid. As teenagers, we heard the hushed conversations of the adults around us in the need for equal rights. But not much changed for me personally, as there was no television in South Africa to help give an informed understanding that life under the South African apartheid sky was unfair, that it was grossly harmful to the human psyche. It made me uncomfortable to live this way, but I did not have the courage to articulate it. Rather, it was university life that brought the perspective that I, along with all my childhood friends and our families, deserved better, a right to fair treatment. Fear was deep-seated. It took decades before that understanding came home to roost. I joined protest marches and secret meetings for the desired release of Nelson Mandela. He, Almadiba, was the hope we hung on to. His much-awaited release in 1990 was music to every ear that struggled under the oppression of legislated racism. The subsequent oneness of the nation became my landmark moment, a time of tremendous transformation intake. I felt pride and a level of confidence that unity was possible. But fear during those pulsating euphoric days continued to crawl beneath my skin like a virus that had gnawed my soul. Thank you for listening. I hope you read the rest of my story, Fear and Hope. Hi, I'm Christina Hoag and I live in Santa Monica, California in the United States. Something that really helped me find a sense of belonging was discovering that I was a third culture kid, as kids who grow up moving from country to country are called. I found this term on the internet when I was researching international children one day, and I bought a book that many TCKs refer to as their Bible, and I found myself within its pages. I then found a bunch of TCK groups on Facebook. My whole life, I'd only ever run into a few people who grew up as I did, but now I'd finally found my tribe. Here's an excerpt from my piece, Belonging is Not a Place. Where are you from? My brain spins into a checklist as to whether I answer with the long version of my life or the short. Am I ever going to see this person again? Has this person ever traveled abroad? Do I even feel like telling the long version? Most of the time, I go with the short version. It's just easier. I'll be spared the glazed look of incredulity, the conversation topic switch that time and again has invalidated my upbringing moving among seven countries and validated me as an oddity. New Jersey, I say. Relief comes with a sense of falseness. I'm not telling the truth because I don't really have an answer. I'm not from anywhere. I was born in New Zealand. I should have been born in the remote copper mining town of Mafalira in Zambia. My father, a mining engineer from New Zealand sheep country, worked at the mine. My mother, from England, was a nurse at the mine hospital. When she was about to give birth to me, my father whisked her off to New Zealand and I went to the world. A mere three weeks later, we were at a remote gold mine on a palm-studded Fijian island. Then Dad's job took us to Sweden, England, Nigeria, back to New Zealand, and then Australia, and finally the United States. That's where the New Jersey bit comes in. All before my 13th birthday. So, I have no home. In fact, I have no real claim to any country. Over the course of my life, I've been a chameleon, changing myself to belong wherever I am. Growing up among moving internationally, self-erasure was an essential part of that process. The worst move was when we moved from Australia to America when I was 13. 
America, my two younger siblings and I thought with excitement, land of the Brady Bunch, Disneyland, and hamburgers. But we were in for a rude shock. Although I spoke English, I thought, Americans couldn't understand me. I had to repeat everything, sometimes multiple times. Every time I opened my mouth in class, head swiveled to see where this weird accent was coming from, which made me never want to speak at all. I had to adapt by shedding my former self. When I moved to the West Coast in 2007, the similarities between California and Australia, with its sun-baked summers and mild wet winters, forced an unexpected unearthing of buried memory. I passed clumps of eucalyptus trees, bark peeling in huge curls to expose ghostly white trunks. We'd had a towering eucalyptus, which are called gum trees in Australia, in our own back garden. Cackling kookaburras perched on its branches before swooping down to snatch strips of meat my mother would hang on the clothesline for them. As I walked around houses in springtime Los Angeles, the sweet scent of wisteria transported me to my neighbor's house in Sydney, awash in vines of per perfumed lavender blooms. I lazed on a bluff in Malibu beneath the slain, cloudless blueness that I once played Mother May I under. The mountains behind me were carpeted with the same parched terrain of fire-prone, dull green brush. With the spangled Pacific Ocean stretched before me, connecting the continents of my past and present, I watched bronze surfers jog by, boards tucked under their arms, just like at Bondi Beach. It reminded me that I had a past worth remembering. Thank you, and for the full version, it's in the Literary Journal. A kwai, Rebecca Pelkey Nui Suwank, uh, Nayu Mohiksa, Ni Wichi Ayam Kurawakanak. Uh, my name is Rebecca Pelkey. I am Mohegan from the Brother Town Indian Nation of Wisconsin. Um, as far as belonging goes, I definitely think that I continue to struggle with that. Um, as a person of mixed heritage, both indigenous and um, European. I, I, you know, I struggle to figure out where to fit in sometimes, and also I have what is called passing privilege. I walk the world as a white person. I'm not immediately identifiable as indigenous. Um, but the more that I immerse myself in my cultural traditions, the less of an outsider I sort of feel. So, um, one of the big important things for me has been learning uh, one of my ancestral languages, which is Mohegan. Um, it's been really important to me feeling like a part of a community. I had sort of no idea before I started learning Mohegan how much language shapes the way that we know things, not just what we know, but how we know them. So um, it has helped me consider things from a Mohegan worldview, Mohegan perspective. So for example, in the Mohegan language, there are no adjectives. Uh, all the things that we think of as adjectives are verbs. So that means that, um, as an example, we wouldn't say the sky is blue. It'd be more like, translated roughly, it'd be more like the sky is being blue right now, which means that in a few minutes, the sky could be being purple or orange or gray. And it just opens the whole world up to all of these possibilities of motion and change and and sort of knowing things like that um, shapes the way we know the world and that has really helped me sort of feel like I have some more understanding and therefore belonging in uh, my indigenous culture. So the poem that I uh, am going to read for you today is called Nupukkakwash Kwishki Kwipit or braids. It's what I'm calling an unraveling villanelle. When I braid my hair, I always close my eyes. My hands remember what in the mirror I forget, though I don't often give myself braids because I fight my white skin telling me I have to prove my bloodlines. So when I braid my hair, I also close my eyes. My fingers remember a pattern, a basket weave my body knows, even though I don't often knit my hair into braids. 
Like Tommy can't not write nature poems, my fingers twist this one, two, three again, though I say I don't, but never with open eyes. Napuk, hookwash, quishki, quipit, hair that returns in turning. But to return means to face where I come from, and when I do, I have to close my eyes. To Putney, thank you. Hamati. Her hands, sturdy, assured, drew me in. No polished surface, even manicure. Constant moving, ever sifting, counting almonds, dried lentils, sesame, bulgur wheat. Her days, each grain infinitely measuring. Patience lay in her fingers, strong, quick, calloused from stuffing and rolling wadik anna. Pounding lamb, chopping garlic, removing the thorns of wild akub, lifting steaming pots of shorba as she pulled something out of almost nothing. Those hands poured and stirred bitter dark powder coffee and aromatic cardamom in a small halai over a gas lit flame. In ritual ceremony, she served the nectar as the sun rose. She drank the dregs as dust descended. Each gesture of long cigarette stained fingers, supple, strong, elegant, as white pepper, nutmeg, cinnamon, salt, allspice, bless the meat, melochia and rice. A daily kitchen ritual my mother-in-law performed, emulating her mother and her mother's mother in that sacred space. I observed her hands, different from mine, listened and repeated a tongue far from mine, learned the ways of her life, how to breathe her language of hopes and dreams, a rhyme for each time, measure, texture, ingredient, Arabic verse noted for a posterity when those hands would lie still on her chest, and she would dream of olive trees in Safat, in a home no longer her home, and a land no longer the land of her people. Hi, I'm Aisha Kasim, and I'm a writer from Cape Town, South Africa. And for me, belonging was something I found in the most unexpected place and in the most unexpected way. But the thing that it taught me was sameness in diversity. It taught me that no matter who we are or where we're from or what we believe, there is always that commonality between people. And so I'm really excited to have my essay published in this edition of Yellow Arrow Journal, which focuses on and fractures, which means things that bend but do not break. In my essay, it's called The Suitcase, and I'll be doing a short read. I have been searching for Sakina all my life, that inner tranquility that is unshakable. But rather than a knowing and acceptance, I have instead been haunted by a restless heart. It is this restlessness that has led me many times to strange lands, to unfamiliar faces, and sometimes to the start of a whole new life where I reinvent myself anew. As if rearranging DNA, I choose the things I hope to keep and discard other things as if I can simply pick them up off the floor and rearrange them yet again. I have since learned, though, that so much of identity is fluid. I think we invent and reinvent ourselves many times in one lifetime. But there are also some things that, like anchors, bind us to that which we cannot let go of. 
Belonging is a strange thing. We sameness feels like immunity. Immunity from the criticism of the other. A commonality that is a safety net from whatever lurks beyond it. To leave the herd is to venture alone into the unknown, to risk uncertainty. And as everyone knows, those who wander alone are always the first to get eaten. But sometimes it is necessary to walk alone, even when the darkest places, as I've since discovered, are almost always the places within yourself. At the time, I was 20, and life had offered me an invitation, an all-expenses-paid scholarship and apartment abroad, more than 13,000 kilometers from Cape Town to a small university town in the Netherlands, halfway around the world. But, like all invitations, there is always an unspoken agreement. One, accept the invite. And two, when you arrive, no matter what happens, make sure it looks like you're having the time of your life. And I was in for the time of my life. I had never been away from home before, away from my culture and community, a minority group at the very bottom of Africa. Like any minority group though, questions of belonging always linger. Who are we? What is our history? How do we fit in? And if we fit in, what do we have to give up? More so if, like me, that history includes complicated realities rooted in slavery, oppression and discrimination. But these were the questions that, at the time, I was convinced I had already answered. I knew exactly who I was. This is, of course, the privilege of youth, where you think you know it all when really you have barely scratched the surface of your own understanding. So I packed my identity in a suitcase, or so I thought. The rest was what I had on my body and what could be seen from my shadow. But I am neither my body nor my shadow, which brings me to the suitcase. I hope you enjoyed this read. Hi, my name is Patricia Wright, and I'm a Canadian of Jamaican descent. I'm also a mental health advocate, writer, and speaker. I believe the time where I came into my own acceptance and belongingness was based on a combination of things. However, the moment I recall most vividly is when I decided to move away from where I grew up. I chose a location where I knew no one, nor did I have any amenities, such as a place to live, money, or a job. At that point, I realized I had begun living for myself, and unbeknownst to me, live as I envisioned and not someone else's vision for my life. My poem is called Nature's Fingerprint. I just want to say thank you so much to Yellow Arrow for publishing my poem. It's an acrostic poem, and I'm going to read that for you now. Ageful roots as tortuous as mine house nebulous imprints in a riveted yet porous outer crest. Framed to perfection, protecting tight innards full of sappy marrow. Rings go round and round year after year, accenting the raucous moments of my soul growth. Carousing along with life's breath, I stretch spreading wistful tendrils towards a sky full of grace and redemption, urgent in hoping for its rays to spring forth my heart's fruit. Open and shut, the seasons change my style and shade, and I, unremarkable, sway free amongst the sounds of a meandering wind. I hope you all enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Nuha Fariha. I'm a first-generation Bangladeshi-American writer. I'm in my first year of my MFA in creative writing at Louisiana State University. Uh, my work has appeared in Magma, Jamhor, Stone of Madness Press, and of course forthcoming in Yellow Arrow Journal. 
I live in Baton Rouge with my nine-month-old son and my partner. So growing up as a Bangladeshi in America, I often did not feel a sense of belonging. As a Muslim, as an immigrant, and as a woman in America, there's a sense that my body doesn't fully belong to me, that my choices were not my own to make. Recently, however, as I became a mother, as I went through the process of childbirth, of breastfeeding, of rearing a, a mixed-race child in America, it's given me a sense of agency and a sense of control and finally a sense of belonging in myself and my body. I found that through this process I've fallen in love with myself because I now see myself as someone who is able to provide not only for myself but also for my larger family. And so it's with the sense of empowerment that I began writing this poem in which I see the tiger in the cage and cry. And I'm very excited to read it for you guys today. So I'll start. In which I see the tiger in the cage and cry. Tiger as myth. Fearsome tiger leaps from Blake's history books. Lonesome Shere Khan hunts for Mowgli. Tigger jumps to Pooh. Raja strides next to Jasmine. Richard Parker carries pie through the Atlantic Ocean. Tony cries great from every box of Lostered Flakes. Tiger as Homeland. Tiger statues on Grandpa's wooden desk with the flan rotating counterclockwise and the hum of cicadas and chickens in the courtyard. Tigers carved on the train's railing as we waved goodbye. Tigers painted on the sides of rickshaws, flashes of orange, black, and white, and the blistering heat of Dhaka traffic. Tigers growl in the village after dark and snatch babies through unguarded windows. Tiger as allegories. Tigers flee from mangrove to mangrove as the water tides rise higher and higher. Tigers facing the blunt end of the colonizer's shotgun as they limp into the forest. Tiger sits in cage. Tiger has muzzled mouth, declawed feet, drooping head, shaggy sunken coat. Tiger leaves flies buzzing in its wake. Tiger flinches from human hands. Tiger is afraid of foreign lands. Tiger visits me night after night after night after night. Tiger chases me. I set the tigers free. Hi, I'm Maria Elena Montero. I was born and raised in the Washington DC area where I still live now. Thank you so much to the Yellow Arrow family, to Keshni and to Kapua for including my essay, Four Quarters in the Infraction Anthology. Four Quarters is an essay about a time I was othered, reduced to a fraction by someone else's perspective, their limited experience. I started making these private recitals in my head about all of my own percentages, my own quarters, and it became this essay, Four Quarters. Ultimately, understanding that I don't owe anyone a viewer's guide, an explanation, an education as to what makes me up, who I am, all the pieces of me, all the pieces of everything I am and, and my life. Thank you so much for sharing this reading with me. Uh, I hope you enjoy Four Quarters, and I'm going to read just a little bit of it now. And then here comes Chef, in his three-quarter length coat, sprinting almost. The eager eyes arrived ahead of him. The kids dispersed. He is the manager, after all, and his interruption was something other than his own courtesy and hellos for my cousin and me. I haven't seen you in so long, he heralded, giddy, tying then retying the sash on his coat. We've been right here, I said, in our usual spot. You didn't make a reservation. I always see your name in the reservations. I didn't know you knew my name, I countered. I was flattered. Wow, I thought, that's great personal service. Oh, yeah, he said, nodding his head, as if it should be no surprise he knew me. He remembered me. I can't forget your name, he said, because it's Hispanic, right? What are you, a quarter? The question lingered just past his lips. I understood why, he asked. I knew why Chef made his estimation. It's not anything I hadn't heard before. I know I look like all others to him. 
I blend into the brown on the seats like the others in the booth next to us and the next and the next. I am one of them and could not be anything else, speak anything else. I surely would be named something matching the others, matching me were it not for this fluke, this one quarter gaff. What are you, a quarter? I am four quarters, the deepest brown on the spectrum right before the red-blue-green balance will return outright black. My undertones are brown too, as if God ensured there was backup in case the top coats failed. My hair used to be the same brunette as my skin, almost black, shiny, dark, dark brown, but gray has invaded and I am unable and unwilling to go to war against her. So she leaves streaks of auburns and bronzes in places where she's negotiating with the woolly canvas to surrender. What are you, a quarter? I am four quarters invisible. But for my name, which is four quarters memorable for betraying the rest of me. I am four quarters weary to be so proud of a thing. My mommy stories, my papi stories, my abuela, my hips, my eyes, the way I'd rather have sancocho instead of chicken soup, the way something in me finds a rumba rhythm in everything I hear, my language, my recipes, only for a chef to slice me with a dull knife, then hand me reduced slices inadequate for me, the smallest pieces with parts stuck to place of their exposure and perspective. Some of those chefs have looked like me. I am four quarters experienced in being numerators and denominators and in ratios more or less generous depending on the chef. I've been percentages, I've been speculations, I've been amazement, and I've been disbelief. I am four quarters unable to understand how I become less than whole because I am wholly unexpected still. Thank you. Hello, I'm the poet Yvonne. Ever since childhood, I belong to the outsiders. The poem I'm going to read, Unfinished Stories, 1956 to 58, is a testament to that. Unfinished Stories, 1956 to 1958. One flight above us, a bookkeeper or something, single and wasn't that sad, watched the same Sunday TV as us, Ed Sullivan and Alfred Hitchcock. A fake redhead with a broad red face, spilled there a bit of her life. She likes to drink. Mother sighed and daddy winked. Opposite our first floor place, a stooped widow on pension with loose false teeth and a mouthful of mucus, thin and yellow as a plucked chicken, shopped for day old bread and cake and shared with us. Did she think we looked poor? Did mother reject what we might not eat? She's got an ungrateful son. Another loner lived on the opposite top floor. Could he and the fake redhead get together and black and white TV films cluttering my preteen summer brain? That might have been smart. When he left, black evangelicals filled his space with an earnest son. Don't believe in earnest, mother on alert. After so much family death, Daddy spurn baptism of any sort. Hi, my name is Jesenia Chavez and I live in Los Angeles, California. And for me, when I started to feel like I belonged was when I was confronted with 
a space where I didn't belong, funny enough, where I felt like the other, where I felt uh, every day was a struggle to survive. And that's because I grew up in Southeast Los Angeles in a predominantly working class Latinx community. And I went to a super uh, white space like you see Santa Barbara that where there was a lot of people that didn't look like me, didn't sound like me, but I found my belonging in the pages of books written by women of color, by seeing my beautiful Chicana uh, professors like Dr. Chela Sandoval, Denise Segura, Maria Herrera Sobek, and by being at the Multicultural Center at UCSB where I was able to see and celebrate artists of color, movies, poetry, um, musical performances, all of those things um, helped me to start to feel like I belonged and also through the act of remembering the beautiful women, the strong women in my family and the men in my family as well that have uplifted us through uh, our immigrant struggle, through their immigrant struggle and their migration to the United States. And so that's kind of what my poem is a little bit about. And also because it was the pandemic and I had a lot of plants here and I was obsessed with plants. So here goes my poem. It is titled Uprooted Roots. I often feel uprooted, but I'm unsure of where I should be planted. I often wonder where is my home? I know everyone says it's deep inside of you, pero a veces se me hace difícil ubicarme. Is there a GPS? Is there a cure at Home Depot's garden section to help? I am rooted in my Mexican Chicana Los Angeles identity. I am from Southeast Los Angeles. I am a gaucho. I am a Bruin. I am a survivor. I am an educator, a poet, and a chiona too. I am rooted, but I often feel uprooted. Are my roots diseased? Do they need to be cut? I want to be replanted in fertile soil that is my own, my own space, my own land. These roots of displacement go way back. Historical trauma deep inside, a sense of loss deep inside, leaving me feeling empty and lonely too sometimes. The roots inside me, the roots inside me, the roots inside me, they need medicine. They need fertile soil to be planted in the ground, to be uplifted with enough sunshine and water too. Sometimes I feel them. I feel the tug of oneness. I feel connected. I feel at ease. I can hold on to the words and the spaces in between to find them. Roots inside of me, roots inside of me, perhaps if I say it enough, I will believe what everyone says. I will feel like I belong everywhere. I will find pretty planters and be replanted as often as I'd like. I will pull on the complex network of roots and draw strength and love and energy like they did it, like they survived much harsher times. Our grandmothers, our mothers, our ancestors. I can feel the tug. I can feel the push. Lift your head up, girl. Levanta tu cabeza. Tú vales mucho. Tú también perteneces a este lugar robado. You belong here in this stolen place, this violated place, this used place. A este lugar violado. A este lugar usado. Es tu lugar. Tómalo. Me gritan. Me susurran. Y a veces sí escucho. Take it. They yell. They whisper. And sometimes, sometimes, I listen. Hi, my name is Rachel Heath. I am a writer and teacher from South Carolina, currently residing on the land of the Chorotega in Costa Rica. And when I think about belongingness, I can't really pinpoint a specific moment. Uh, when belonging felt like it had landed. But I can say that belongingness became much less complicated when I stopped feeling like I needed to belong. The long road of inner work that brought me to a space of self-love made belongingness feel warm and inviting because I had learned to belong to myself. And with that said, I'm going to be sharing a poem with you uh, titled Lineage. Remember the deep dive of hips that transcended the shape of ships to pull forth a race of people that are a perpetual song of grace and forgiveness devoured by a root monster let loose to face those who would forget from whence all of us sprang. Remember the back-baked 
brown of skin under a cotton filtered sun, marching hands and cadenced words that beat against God's door to ask for strength to push through until the workday finally ended and night brought the relief of a cool breeze and the arms of each other, which was the one and only seat of love in this ugly space that had turned their coy limbs into lumbering hunks of chattel. Remember the mouth of night that allowed for singing different songs with bodies and fingers and tongues that found skin that still had enough feeling left to taste a bit of joy and a flavor with a bit of sasson. Remember the fever pitch of a shotgun cocked just so against a worn down hip, poised and ready to knock the air out of anyone that would disrespect her place on this earth that she and those before her had worked to make green and fertile. Light your candles, sister, and pour your libation sweet upon the earth and upon your delicate pink tongue, stained wine deep with remembering of words that you have no meaning for outside of the waves that ripple through your cells and send your feet soaring into dance and palpitations. Remember, sister, that even after all the darkness that would cast its pall over the shining newness of your generation, that joy is a birthright never severed from your lineage. Remember, sister, to place the candles just so, to allow the shadows to play against the walls and dance with you. Remember, on this hallowed occasion, to let the ancestors in, to ride the waves of moonlight with them, and fill up on the essence of that which built your city of light. Thank you.